The world of handheld PC gaming is heating up this week. Ghostwire got mixed reviews, but I was able to fix some of my biggest gripes on the Steam Deck. A new handheld gaming PC was just stealth announced. We also have some small insight into Steam Deck sales, and I have lots of deck updates for you. Let's get into it. What's good deck gang? Ghostwire Tokyo launched on Friday. At the time, I was busy making a Kirby video for y'all, but I'm happy to say that I gave it a shot over the weekend. It does have some significant issues. Namely, it doesn't launch out of the box on the Steam Deck, and the aiming controls are sluggish. But it is a nice looking game, and I'm really digging the Japanese mysticism vibe so far. So I'm glad that I was able to get the game running well, with some minimal tweaks. Most important, of course, is the matter of getting it to run. Currently, the official Steam Deck compatibility status is unknown, but in its current state, there's no doubt that it would earn an unsupported badge. It soft crashes immediately when loading the splash screen videos. Technically, you can rename these videos so they never play, but that will only get you so far. It will still have a problem whenever you encounter any cutscene. For that reason, you'll have to use Proton GE. If you're unfamiliar with Proton GE, it's a fork of Proton that's maintained by Glorious Eggroll, hence GE. You can install an app on the Discover Store called Proton Up QT in order to manage the various versions of Proton GE that you might want to install. Instances like these demonstrate why we still need community maintained tools like Proton GE as well as Proton DB. If it weren't for the latter, I wouldn't know that I specifically needed GE version 7.2. This seems to be the only one that gets me past the opening door in the hospital. I don't know for a fact that you can finish the entire game on 7.2, but I haven't run into any issues since I switched. The next problem I had were the controls. Aiming was so sluggish that it made Uncharted 4 feel like Counter-Strike. Now, the creative team has every right to have a unique vision and see it through, but the vision wasn't fun for me, so I quickly toyed with the controls and made it better. There are in-game settings you can modify, but honestly I just made the trackpad and gyro control as a mouse. The only problem is that the button icons would switch whenever it read my mouse input, but they would switch right back whenever I used the button or analog stick, so it never got in the way for me. And finally, onto graphics. On Windows, this game has some persistent stuttering issues, but it appears those are all shader compilation issues because they didn't seem to be present on the Steam Deck. That's not to say the game performs flawlessly. Assuming a 30 FPS lock, the game can dip below 25 pretty often at the default graphical settings, all while utilizing the full 25 to 26 watts of total system power. That would be wildly under 2 hours of battery life even with an FPS lock. Thankfully, there's no reason to stick to the default graphical settings. You have the option of using in-game FSR or TSR here. Both are fine. If you go with balanced level scaling, you can get around 16-17 watts of total system power without destroying the image quality. You can turn down settings like global illumination and screen space reflection, but that had less noticeable impact on the frame rate or power consumption. I stuck with the default settings and TSR set to balance for about two and a half hours of battery life. As for the game itself, I'm not sure what to think yet. In many ways, it feels like a temple title, but like from 10 years ago. That's not something I was in the market for. The city is beautiful and the paranormal and mystic themes are refreshing, but the gameplay itself feels dull early on. Hopefully more skills and new enemies will liven it up a bit. But that's the present of handheld PC gaming. But what does the future hold for us? Well, we finally got small information about a new generation device, and it sounds awesome. Now, to be clear, when I say new generation, I'm referencing graphics card generations, not console generations. This represents a one year leap and not a five to 10 year leap, but the details still sound super cool. So I'm talking about none other than the GPD WinMax 2, whose details were revealed to us by the Fox over on Twitter. So what does the Fox say? He tweeted, quote, the king will return, end quote, with a very bare mock-up of what we can expect. Here are the details he gave us in the tweets that followed. In true GPD Win fashion, this is a clamshell device. The display is 10.1 inches with a 2560 by 1600 resolution. That's twice the number of pixels in either direction than that of the Steam Deck, or four times the resolution overall. There are ultra narrow bezels, so it looks like the device wouldn't be much larger than the 10.1 inches across in total. And notably, this is a landscape display. It does also have a full usable keyboard. The original GPD Win Max has really small keys and a number row and function row are even smaller. Remarkably, the Win Max 2 will only be slightly larger than the original Win Max despite the larger screen and full size keyboard. When it comes to memory, you'll be able to buy either a 16GB or 32GB option. And with regard to storage, 
there is space for a double sided 2280 as well as an additional 2232. If you use both for storage, you can easily clear a few terabytes, but optionally you can use the 2232 for an LTE module, so that's neat as well. In addition, there are multiple SD card slots and support for A2 class cards. What impressed me the most are the controls. The analog sticks will now use Hall sensors and they've added gyro in what they're calling a 3x3 6-axis design. The shoulders are analog like the GPD Win 3 and now hide the controls. There's also a built-in webcam, four speakers, Thunderbolt 4, and full USB-C support. The first chip that they're going to use is going to be an Intel i7-1280p, and this is all inside of an aluminum unibody design supported by a 65 watt hour battery. I don't want to undersell how amazing these details are. It places GPD exactly where they need to be strategically in a post Steam Deck world. They can't compete on a price to performance basis, but they can become a new luxury option and that's what this is. 1600p gaming with fully kitted controls, an impressive array of I.O. that can support external GPUs, room for terabytes of storage all inside of a premium case. I can see why anyone with the cash to spare would consider something like this and I can't wait to hear more. Okay, let's pivot back to Steam and talk about the weekly top sellers. For Ghostwire, both the pre-order and the game proper cracked the top 10 of Steam's top sellers this week. Elden Ring maintains its number one spot for the third week in a row, and will you look at this? Steam Deck maintains its own streak with the third week at number two. Granted, this is not a surprise. If you don't know by now, these top sellers are measured by revenue, and each Steam Deck sold is anywhere from 6.5 to 11 times the amount of revenue for a full price game. Still, this gives us some amount of information. I think most notable is that Valve have maintained a good throughput in these first few weeks. As they promised, they didn't blow their load at launch with little to show for it in the weeks after. They continue to have a steady supply and sell through it as we're entering Q2. Now, while this doesn't give us hard numbers, we should recall that Lawrence Yang from Valve has said that they will quickly get to the tens of thousands of units sold in the first month and hundreds of thousands of units sold in the second month. I suspect that given these top seller charts, they're in good shape to make do on that promise as well. I hope that at some point they give us a peek behind the curtain and let us know how many units have been sold. Staying on the topic of sales, the last Q1 emails have gone out by now. That's right, everyone that had a Q1 ETA should have already had the chance to order their deck. Next week will be the first batch of emails for Q2 prospects. Valve have also updated Steam to alert when you can order your Steam Deck, so keep an eye on those notifications. Outside of sales and shipping, there are surprisingly a good number of Steam Deck related updates this week. First up, you should be aware that some people are having issues with USB docks that are effectively bricking their Steam Deck. After plugging in the dock, the deck no longer holds a charge. Back in my accessories buying guide, I suggested that it would be safer to wait before buying a dock, and that still looks to be the case, unfortunately. I have been using the Anchor dock that I recommended in that video, and I've had no issues so far, but if possible, I would just suggest waiting for an official dock. Also, OBS Studio launched into Steam last week. This is great, however, it doesn't work yet in the gaming mode of SteamOS. Hopefully, that can be addressed somehow. With regard to software, I and many others have had some criticisms of the deck compatibility rating system. Perhaps as a result of that criticism, Valve has created a new opt-in feedback system. In addition to Valve collecting objective data about crashes and issues surrounding deck verified games, they are now asking users if their experience with a game matches the compatibility rating. This can do nothing but help shape the QA, QC process that Valve currently have in place around compatibility ratings. Speaking of compatibility, we are now up to over a thousand verified games and almost another thousand playable. I think you know what that means. Yep. Add these to your wish list. If you don't know by now, this is the segment where I dig through the newly released or newly evaluated games to find some hidden gems on the Steam Deck for y'all. So let's get started with Norco. Norco is a point and click adventure from the wonderful folks at Raw Fury. The pixel art scenes are so gorgeous, I would genuinely hang them up on my wall if I could. It's set in Greater New Orleans and has you unraveling a mystery as you search for your brother. If you like Kentucky Route Zero or Disco Elysium, consider picking this game up. Thanks to the developers of Etora for sending me a copy. It's an action-adventure platformer that launched last week. 
The art style is colorful and vibrant owing to the hand-painted Central and South American landscapes. The animations are similarly stunning. The combat and platforming felt good in terms of controls, but there was a conspicuous absence of challenge and therefore player expression. I don't only want difficult games, but I was pretty much on autopilot the entire time. For what it's worth, I'm still in the early stages, and I hope the rest of Atora offers more substance in that regard. Guys, guys, if you like Geometry Wars, you're going to want to try Devastator. Sometimes I just need that twin stick shooter goodness in my veins and Devastator delivers. It has three different modes. The main one is quadrants and it challenges you to last three minutes. The map is broken up into quadrants and each one has a large power up that transforms the layout of the opposing quadrant. So it keeps you on your toes the entire time. This is another game that came out last week, so it hasn't made it through the compatibility rating process, but I didn't encounter any reason that it wouldn't be deck verified. Mini matches was a big surprise for me this week. Given the local multiplayer aspect, it was not on my radar, but the developers sent me a key and I'm really glad they did. Now, to be clear, this is first and foremost a party game. In the single player, you play against bots and it surprisingly kept my interest, but this is meant to be played with friends and sadly, I, I don't have any. It has a bit of a WarioWare vibe where you don't know which minigame they're about to throw at you, whether it's golf, billiards, or several others, but you have to do your best to roll with the punches and defeat your opponents. You can unlock different characters and they have unique special abilities like the architect who can create a wall which can impede your opponent's progress. It's really, really fun and as soon as I find friends, I'm going to play this with them. First of all, if you don't buy fights in tight spaces, go check out the soundtrack because it slaps. Shout out to my friend JR for putting me onto that soundtrack. But the game itself is a deck building turn based tactics game. The limited space that you have to maneuver places a lot more emphasis on your order of attacks as well as pitting your opponents against each other in a way that reminds me of Into the Breach. In keeping with the vein of some of their previous games like Frozen Synapse, this game has a minimalist art style while maintaining a sense of personality throughout. Niku Niku is an adorably weird adventure platformer with a surprising amount of gameplay variety. You use your slightly awkward controls to do everything from solve logic puzzles, grapple hooks, drive cars, and play basketball. In that vein, the multiplayer modes are worth a look as well. Dundara is a clever platforming metroidvania where the traditional jumping and navigation mechanics are replaced by an ability to point to an applicable platform and immediately land on it with a button press. It feels a bit awkward at first, but I got used to it quickly and before I knew it I was zipping around rooms. The level of challenge felt just right for me and the game throws small new mechanics at you very frequently in the early bits. I love Carrion. It's really short, like four or five hours maybe, but the gameplay and premise are so weird in the best ways. They call it a reverse horror game because it's set in this science experiment gone wrong kind of setting, but you play as the experiment. You're a predator stalking all the scientists that aim to imprison you. The music and art set the atmosphere nicely and the whole campaign rips.
Jamestown remains one of my favorite shmups ever. It's extremely approachable, even for people that are not necessarily fans of the genre. On top of that, there's loads of content. There's like five different difficulty levels, unlockable ships, and challenges, and four-player multiplayer. And the story is the type of nonsense that I love. Look at this prologue text for the first level. It says, War upon the east, frontier in which a settlement is ravaged by botanicaled Martians loyal to the Spanish, and a villain appears. Yeah, that is some campy goodness. This is an indie classic, so go check it out. I've only played a bit of Wuppo so far, but it is incredibly charming. It appears to be quite the hidden gem, even among those of us who enjoy indies. Part of that may be because it's kind of impossible to describe. It's a metroidvania but has shades of Monkey Island too. It does some great world building, and the characters and overall narrative are full of levity without feeling superfluous and saccharine. Pick it up or add it to your wishlist today. That's it for this week. If you're enjoying my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and turn notifications to all. A huge thank you to all my new patrons this month. I'm working on a mega showcase video with all of your requests, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. Until then, deck gang out. Goodbye!